The picture you're seeing on screen is a photograph of Helgeö. It is a tiny island located near Stockholm, housing but a few hundred inhabitants. But in 1950, a resident discovered, by accident, the remnants of something ancient. Archaeologists descended on the island, and their work would continue for 30 years. What they found was extraordinary. Helgeö appears to have been the site of a pagan temple and a marketplace with connections as far away as India. The findings include a Coptic baptism scoop from the 6th century, an Irish crozier from the 9th century, and a figure of the Buddha. Dating back to the 6th century, the Buddha was made in the Swat Valley in modern-day Pakistan, and is believed to have been brought to Scandinavia along an ancient trade route called Österväg. In the Old Norse language, Österväg had two possible meanings. Öster means east, and Vig means road, path, or way, so eastern way. But it could also mean eastern lands. Historians believe that it initially denoted the Baltic countries and Estonia, but may eventually have encompassed Eastern Europe. For the purposes of this video, I will use Österväg to denote the trade route between Scandinavia and the Orient. This video primarily concerns the Viking Age, since this is when the Österväg flourished, and we received the most documented and archaeological sources of its operations. But the road itself predates the Viking Age by thousands of years. Evidence points to Neolithic voyages to the Ural Mountains in order to obtain colored flints, precious and semi-precious stones. Most of the artifacts from Helgeö predate the Viking Age. The most effective way of travel along the Österväg was via boat. The Baltic Sea is almost completely connected to the Black Sea and Caspian via two waterways, the Dnieper in the south and the Volga in the north. When land obstructed these watery paths, the ships had to be moved over them from one body of water to the next. This is called a portage. From the Viking Age, we often have this vivid image of massive longships or merchant vessels pulled over greased logs by the strength of a hundred men and their animals. While this was possible, it would have been extremely unnecessary for the small-scale operations conducted by the Scandinavian traders. A vast majority of archaeological and written evidence points to the traders using small boats. But before I discuss what kind of boats were used by these traders, I need some sort of name for them. Usually, Viking is used to denote any Scandinavian alive during the Viking Age, but this is a modern thing. The Scandinavians call themselves by the region they were from. Most of the Scandinavians traveling eastward were from the coastal middle of Sweden, called Svealand, and the island of Gotland. The people from Svealand called themselves Sviar in their own tongue, or Suiones in Latin. The Gotlanders called themselves Gut. The connection between the Gotlanders, Geats, and the earlier Goths is hotly debated. We know the origin of these travelers from archaeological findings, from runestones, and from what others call them. Archaeological findings include oriental coins and trade goods, which are most heavily concentrated around Svealand and Gotland. Runestones in Sweden and Gotland frequently mention the eastern exploits of local figures. For example, this one reads Holmfrid, Hidinfrid, der lette hagva sten efter Eskil, fadursin, han drög och rustu i Östervägi, att han folkskrimmer falla orthi. My translation into English. Holmfrid, Hidinrid carved his stone for Eskil, their father. He battled in Österväg until he finally fell. And what about their names abroad? Most foreigners saw the Scandinavians as one people. The Finns, who were likely the first to meet them on the Österväg, called them Rutsi. It is still used today to denote people from modern Sweden. It was then adapted by other peoples. The Byzantines called them Ross, and the Muslims Arus. But what does it mean? The consensus seemed to be that it initially denoted people from Ruslagen, a historical region in Svealand. During ancient times it was called Ruden, strongly associated with the Old Norse Ruder, meaning rowing. People from Ruden were called Ruspiggar, meaning inhabitants of Ruden. But I will not call them Rus. Why? Because the name would take on different meanings over time. It would refer to the Scandinavians who settled in the region, forming a political entity called the Ruskagenet. This entity would later be toppled by its Slavic subjects 
and the Scandinavian settlers slowly assimilate into local culture. Rus would then become the identity of the local Slavs and the Slavicized Scandinavians, who together created a new political entity, called the Kievan Rus. There's a lot to be said about the Kievan Rus and the earlier Khanate, the existence of which some have debated, but those are for separate videos in the future. For now, I will call them Varjaks. Varjak, or Varjak, was the Slavic word used to denote the Scandinavian merchants and raiders. It seems to have been used to denote any Scandinavian, much like our use of Viking today. One of the primary period sources when researching this period is the 12th century Tale of Bygone Years, a chronicle of the Kievan Rus. It describes the Varjags as follows. These particular Varjags were known as Rus, just as some are called Swedes and others Normans, English and Gotlanders. The Byzantines also called them Varjags, or rather Varangi, anglicized into Varangian. The word itself is believed to be Scandinavian in origin, so it was likely that the Varjags called themselves as such. Varingi, from the Proto-Nordic Varangangya, Oathwalk, or someone who takes an oath. Oathsworn is a rather modern, fantasy-like variant. With this whole naming debacle out of the way, we can look at the transportation methods the Varjags used on the Österväg. Most evidence points to the Varjags traveling by boat. Whilst it would be possible to travel by large war and merchant vessels, it wouldn't be practical. The large sort of Viking vessels we're familiar with were built in Norway and Denmark for sailing across the ocean. Such constructions were not necessary for the coastlines and rivers of the Österväg. They could easily run aground, needed more materials for repairs, would be too cumbersome to transport over land, and wasn't necessary for transporting the goods brought along the road, which were mostly luxury goods. Life necessities and bulk products like wool, fish, grains, slaves and livestock could be traded on the western route, in larger ships. Instead, the Varjags would have used vessels adapted for the Swedish geography. I'll be using Sweden here not to denote any political entity, simply the geographical areas part of modern-day Sweden. Ancient Sweden was a maritime society. The land areas were much more connected by lakes and rivers than today. It was like a pre-industrial highway. The boats were propelled by sail and oar. Since these boats had to be transported over land masses between waterways, they had to be constructed with several distinct characteristics. For one, they had to be light, either light enough for one or several men to physically carry over a distance, or for them to easily be able to drag it. The keel of the boat was protected by a false keel, otherwise the keel could be damaged when pulled over land and cause balancing issues. In Old Norse, the false keel was called dra, meaning pull. Some of these boats were built with multifunctional holes in the front and back. You could stick a rope in them and use them when hauling the boats on land. One archaeological example of such a vessel is the Viks boat. Uncovered in central Sweden, it was 9.6 meters long, 2.2 meters wide, with a mere height of 54 centimeters. Another example are the Valsjade boats, unearthed in Uppsala, close to where I used to live. They range between 8.5 to 11.7 meters in length, and could carry between 3 to 5 pairs of rowers. The oldest was built in the 7th century, the youngest, the 9th. They were used as graves for what appears to have been aristocrats. They were not only warriors, but traders also, as indicated by their weapons and equipment, but also fine trade goods such as Chinese silk. Aside from the archaeological, we have period descriptions of what sort of boats the Varjags would have used. A Byzantine source from the 10th century, De Administrando Imperio, recounts the following. The rest of them pick up the things they have on board the ships, conduct the wretched slaves in chains, six miles by dry land, until they are past the barrier. In this way, some dragging their ships, others carrying them on their shoulders. They get them through to the far side of the rapid, so, launching the ships back on the river and loading their cargo, they get in and again move off. Besides period sources, Later sources proved their feasibility in the region. In the 6th century, Olaus Magnus described how Russian merchants would trade with the Sami using light boats, which they could carry on their shoulders over land. The picture you're seeing on screen is a woodcut from Olaus Magnus' book. The Sami use similar boats to this day. If you want modern experiments, in 1989, Frenchman Michel Pazel made the journey in a 7.5 meter long snipa, 
a traditional Swedish fishing boat, dating back to the Viking Age. It had six oars and a square sail. In 20 days, Pycelle and crew traveled from Riga to Besikonvici in Belarus, 550 kilometers, averaging 27 kilometers per day. The well-trained crew spent 10 hours a day on the oars. The boat was then carried 90 kilometers to the Dnieper, the delta of which was reached after a total journey of 52 days, including 7 days of rest. Along the route, local boats may also have been utilized. In Ukraine, a Varjag was found buried in a dugout canoe. During the Kievan Rus, the Varjags would have their Slavic subjects build boats for them. But for the most part, they seem to have relied on Scandinavian-built vessels. The act of transporting a vessel over a landmass between two waterways is called portage. It is also the name for the landmass itself. This passage could be improved to ease the carrying of the boats. The best was to dig dikes or even canals. This would allow the boat to stay in the water and be pulled by ropes from the sides of the canal. Most commonly we see boats hauled over logs. Simplest might be to grease them and constantly move them in front of the ship. The most organized was to have a ditch with logs laid out in a path before the boat. Some evidence even points to wheels being used. Some historians have disputed the boat hypothesis and put a bigger emphasis on the idea of the route being conducted in winter. In the Neolithic era, evidence points to sleighs being used. They could easily travel upon frozen rivers. It would also have been much easier to portage a boat over a snowy landmass. But historians seem uncertain as to how important winter travel methods were on the Österweg. I haven't been able to find as much information as there is regarding boats. Though the eastern route is ancient, it definitely appears to have intensified at the start of the Viking Age. It is in the 1750s that important trading hubs appeared in Scandinavia. Towns like Birka near modern Stockholm, which would dominate Swedish trade for the entire period. Around the same time, the Varjags built trading outposts in Estonia and around Lake Ladoga. Another important starting point was, of course, Gotland. Evidence points to the Gotlanders having arrived much earlier, with colonies being built in Latvia in the previous century. Relations with the locals appear to have been peaceful and based on a mutual interest of preserving trade and prosperity. Travel across the Baltic was primarily done along the coastlines. With the lack of proper navigational methods, the most reliable was to use landmarks and supply stations built along the way. Such a route was described in the 12th century as being used by the Danish king, Valdemar. Though no earlier accounts exist, this written instruction is believed by historians to have been based on previous, ancient knowledge. The route led into the Gulf of Finland and then through the river Neva into Lake Larga. One of the most important outposts on the Österväg has been found near Staraja Ladiga on the river Volkov leading down the Ladiga lake. Archaeologists have found remnants of buildings and burial mounds from both Scandinavians and local Finns. Here the Varjags could have resupplied, recruited more sailors and warriors, and repaired their ships. The picture on screen shows graffiti from the 9th century, found in the colony. Further evidence points to Staraja Ladiga having been a melting pot of other foreign cultures, including Frisians and Slovenians. One less explored trading route is the one leading down the western Baltic rivers to modern-day Czechia. During the Viking Age, the area was controlled by a mighty kingdom called Great Moravia. This kingdom would have bought goods from the Varjags and the East in return for salt. The Moravians sat smack dab on a trade route between the Baltic and Mediterranean. It had been used since antiquity. It was primarily used for the export of amber. If you wish to learn more, I highly recommend that you check out my video on the subject, called The Amber Road. After a brief stop at Storaja Ladiga, the older Österväg appears to have returned back up the Ladiga and upstream through the river Svör to Lake Onega. This area was inhabited by the Vepsians, a Finno-Ugric tribe, who were forced to pay tribute to the Varjags. Tribute was usually taken in the form of furs, which was the most important trade export for the Varjags. From the southern part of Lake Onega, the route continued down the river Vitegra, from whence they could reach Lake Belausera, also called Beloye. Here stood a colony of the same name. From Lake Belausera, they continued down the Sheksna into the great river Volga, the longest river in Europe. It would lead them straight to the Caspian Sea, but before then, it would go through the lands of the Khazars. The Khazars were a semi-nomadic Turkic people, ruling over a small empire 
centered around the North Caucasus. Their capital was the city of Attil, located on the Volga Delta in the Caspian Sea, and the most important stopping point on the Österväg. Attil was a melting pot of different cultures and religions. Here mingled Muslims, Christians, Jews, and pagans. By the 9th century, Arab visitors described the Varjags, or Rus, as having their own quarter in the city, which they shared with the Slavs. Adil was the residence of the Khagan, ruler of the Khazars, and the Varjags passing through were obliged to pay him tribute. Many of them chose to stay and served in his court and army. The Khan and his warriors were much admired by the Varjags. They adapted their clothing, hairstyles and even titles. The Varjag ruler of the first kingdom known as Rus titled himself Shaganus, Khagan. I always thought that the most important destination of the Österväg was Byzantium, but for most of its history, it was Persia and the Middle East. This route was far older than the Viking Age, and what the Varjags did was basically just expand on it with new ships and new outposts built along the way. The earliest Islamic source describing trade with the Varjags is the Book of Roads and Kingdoms, written by Ibn Kordabe around 870. He explains that after leaving Adel, the Varjags crossed through the Caspian Sea and landed on whichever shore they wanted. Cordabe relates only one further destination. On occasion they bring merchandise on camels from the Caspian to Baghdad, where Slavic eunuchs serve them as interpreters. They claim to be Christians and pay only head tax. If the Varjags travel as far as Baghdad, they may surely have reached other far-flung places. As for written evidence of it, I've not found any. Cordabe also states that they claim to be Christians and pay only head tax. This surely seems to have been a trick to pay a lower tax. Other Arab writers haven't pulled any punches when it came to describing the heathen customs of the Varjags. You might have heard the famous account written by Ahmad ibn Fadlan, which was partly adapted into the 1999 movie, The Thirteenth Warrior. It's quoted in just about every single video, book and article about the Vikings. Some of the Varjags may have been syncretic or fully Christian, and this number surely increased as the centuries progressed. Many of the Arabic silver coins found in Varjag trading hubs have been defaced. Varjags have marked them with pagan symbols like the Taurus hammer or the Christian cross. Historians believe that this was done to prove that whoever paid with the money wasn't a Muslim. Silver was one of the main products the Varjags brought home. Indeed, the Österväg was primarily used for transporting luxury items. These include spices, color pigments, and various trinkets, beads, and souvenirs. Silk was incredibly important. Scandinavian men and women dressed extravagantly. Graves have been unearthed, where the corpses wore silks from as far away as China. The Varjags also brought home fashion and clothing items, both the stuff of the nomads and the Muslims. One of the most important pieces was the kaftan, a sort of robe or tunic. Initially, historians believed this item to have been imported from Byzantium, but the Byzantines didn't adopt it until the Turkish invasions in the High Middle Ages. The kaftan resembled a Scandinavian piece of underwear called sark. For this reason, the Varjags refer to all Muslim countries as sarkland. In return for these items, the Varjags primarily sold fur. These were brought from Scandinavia, or the various Finnic and Slavic tributaries along the way. Muslim sources mention the prominence of beavers, grey squirrels, and black foxes. The fur of the black fox was valued in the Mediterranean since the days of Tacitus. Another important Varjag export were swords. The Scandinavians were, of course, renowned smiths. Sometimes the swords were brought in a hand. If a local emir was lucky, he might employ the Varjags as mercenaries. A 12th century text called Tariq al-Bab mentioned how Amir Maimun relied heavily on Rus soldiers, which were titled Gulams. In other cases, the Varjags would bring swords for another purpose. In the late 9th century, voyages of commerce were supplanted by raids. Instead of boats, the Varjags were described as arriving in ships. During the reign of Alid Hassan bin Said, between 864 and 884, Ibn Isfandiyar described the Varjags as attacking Abascon in Tabaristan. In 909 and 910, the raids continued. In all three attacks, the Varjags were stopped. In 912, they conducted their greatest attack. An Arab writer named Al-Masudi provided a vivid account. 
the Varjaks scattered over the Caspian Sea and carried out raids in Jilan, Tabaristan, Abascon, and Azerbaijan. Since the people there had never been attacked from the sea before, they were unable to stop the assailants from burning their villages, stealing property, and capturing women and children. Viking trade has long been associated with slavery, but I never found any descriptions of the Varjaks trading slaves with the Khazars or Muslims. This of course doesn't mean that it was never done, but it doesn't seem to have been as prominent as the fur or sword trade. All of the slavery seems to have been conducted during these raids, in which the Varjags also seem to have utilized larger vessels. In 943, Ibn Miskawai recounted an eyewitness disposition. When many refused to go, the Rus used their swords on them and took many as prisoners. Men were gathered in a mosque, women and children in the fortress, and everyone was offered to buy themselves free. Those men who didn't were killed, and women and youngsters were turned into sex slaves. What was the cause for this sudden, brutal aggression? The attacks carried out in the late 9th and early 10th centuries coincides with two events. The foundation of the Rus Khanate, and aggression from a nomadic people called the Pekinegs. One may have caused the other. The Rus Khanate may have been founded to better safeguard the Varjag tributaries, trade routes and colonies, all of which were threatened by the Pekinegs. But the expansion of this new entity in the region may also have provoked the Pekinegs. Either way, the Varjags had need for warriors, and when these warriors were done with the Pekinegs, they still wanted action, and they still wanted payment, so raiding was the way to go. Using the existing route was the logical next step. Eastward aggression may also have been caused by friction with the Khazar Khan. The tale of bygone years mentioned how in 882, the Rus Khanate began stealing tributaries from the Khan. Some scholars believe this may have led to the Khan closing the trade route altogether. Thus, Varjag aggression was an attempt to reopen the valuable flow of Arabic silver. On some occasions, the Khazar appeared fine with Varjag attacks as long as they paid him a share of the plunder. On other occasions he tried to stop them, and even sought support from both the Muslims and Byzantines. In some cases he could stop them, in other cases he couldn't. In 960, the Varjags conducted the greatest attack on the Khazars. Led by the Rus prince, Igor, the Varjags first captured the city of Belavesha, possibly modern-day Sarkal. This opened the trade route to the Caspian Sea. From then on, they destroyed the cities of Adel, Kassaran, and Samandar. In Samandar there had been 40,000 vineyards, and according to the Arab writer Ibn Hakal, not a single grape remained after the Rus attack. This event marked the beginning of the end for the Khazar Empire. Another cause behind the downfall of the Österweg may have been the Byzantines, directly or indirectly. Shortly after the foundation of the Rus Khanate, a Varjag fleet descended upon Constantinople in what would be the first of many attacks on the city. Eventually, Varjags and Byzantines would sign a peace treaty and a new trade route opened, which would come to surpass the eastern one. But this route, the road to Mikla Gord, will have to be tackled in its own separate video. If you're watching this in the far future, this video is most likely published and available. But if you're watching this before its release, I suggest you check out my video on the much older Amber Road, the trade network between the Baltic and ancient Mediterranean. I also have a video on the Farmen, which was the name of the Viking merchants traveling both east and west. Please enjoy, and stay tuned for further adventures.